On this podcast, I want to talk about unprocessed red meat and colon cancer. I don't think there's any real evidence that there's a causality here at all. And I will show you that throughout this podcast. Beef organs for everyone. Check out this review from Angie B on our beef organ supplement from Hard and Soil Supplements. She says, me, my boyfriend, his daughter have embarked on an animal-based diet. We are eating organ meat once a week. I call it Weird Parts Wednesday. And we've been using Hard and Soil Supplements. Beef organs is a great supplement to our healthy lifestyle and a great way to add more organs into a kid's diet. I'm so happy these products exist. If you are considering investing in these products, then you are considering investing in your health and your future. Don't wait. My family and I are so grateful to have access to nature's most sacred and primal vitamins. Thank you, Heart and Soil. Thanks, Angie, for leaving this review on our stuff. You can find Heart and Soil supplements to get your desiccated organs if you are not getting fresh organs or if you want to supplement your consumption of fresh organs at Heart and Soil. Co. That's heartandsoil.co. Our mission is to help you reclaim your birthright to optimal health. Also want to let you guys know that the Kale is Bullshit shirts are real and they're available. You can go to kaleisbullshit.shop. I'm getting some really cool merch going. I can't wait to see you guys in grocery stores. Uh, maybe even in Austin or somewhere in the States, I'll see somebody in a Kale is Bullshit shirt. I'll give you a high five and a fist bump. Uh, we've also got hats. We've got seed oils are bullshit shirt. We've got the old school Stay Radical shirts. We've got all kinds of good merch there. We've got hoodies, kaleisbullshit.shop. If you want to rep the movement and let everybody know that you think kale is bullshit. On this week's podcast, I addressed one of the most common questions that I've seen recently in my DMs. What about red meat and cancer? So something I've spoken about in the past, but I tried to do a succinct, in-depth discussion of this, talking about a lot of science, a lot of explanation of why I don't think red meat is a problem for cancer at all. So I think you guys will enjoy this podcast and it will open your eyes to a lot of the ways that we've been misled by the mainstream media, mainstream science in terms of red meat and cancer and red meat for human health in general. As I say in the podcast, it just seems to me that there's some sort of anti-meat agenda and I believe meat is incredibly good for humans. So I rebel against that and do this work. On to the podcast, my friends. Red meat causes colon cancer, right? Everyone knows this. I mean, it's almost a truism to say that even if you eat red meat, you must limit the amount of red meat you eat because it's bad for you. It's going to cause heart disease, subject of a different podcast. It's going to cause colon cancer. If you go onto something like Dr. Google or any search engine for that matter, and you type in red meat and cancer, you know what you're going to find. A ton of articles, mostly epidemiology, in fact, almost entirely epidemiology, showing you that red meat consumption is associated with increased rates of colon cancer and perhaps other cancers too. In this podcast, I'm going to break down why this isn't the whole story in any way, shape, or form. And I'm going to show you many lines of evidence that draw this into significant questions and discuss why this is evolutionarily inconsistent and advance an argument that red meat doesn't have anything to do with colon cancer at all. And it's completely safe for humans to eat, very nutritious, and the main side effect of eating it is just feeling really good, looking good, and living your life well, as our ancestors have known for hundreds of thousands of years. So let's start here with a simple search, red meat, colon, cancer. And all of the articles you will find will tell you that red meat, either processed or unprocessed, will increase your risk of colon cancer. We probably can't even do a search to find red meat decreases risk of colon cancer. We still get all of the same things. Red meat increases the risk of colon cancer. Too much red meat increases the risk of colon cancer. Red meat and colorectal cancer. Red meat and bowel cancer, the evidence. Red meat and bowel cancer, how strong is the evidence? That one might actually call it into question. Moderate intake of red meat tied to higher colorectal cancer rates. Okay, so... Unless you are a very savvy researcher or you have some sort of a question regarding the evolutionary consistency of eating red meat and colon cancer, that being that humans have very likely made red meat from deer, antelope, elk, pronghorn, large animals, that is meat with heme iron in it, that makes it red meat. That's why the meat is red. And most animals other than birds have heme iron in their meat. Even pigs have heme iron in their meat. 
even though pork is considered the other white meat, it still has a significant amount of heme iron in it. So humans have been eating meat and organs that have heme iron, that is an iron atom in a porphyrin ring that makes that iron much more bioavailable for humans and ensures that we do not become anemic. Look at so many vegans and vegetarians who shun meat, they will develop nutrient deficiencies, iron deficiency being one of the most common. Iron deficiency is very common, especially in women who are menstruating every month and losing blood throughout their lives. Very few women are eating, in my belief and many others' beliefs, uh, enough red meat, enough heme iron. The iron found in plants is very poorly bioavailable, like so many minerals we find in plants. And it's pretty clear that humans have an adaptation to absorb from food heme iron rather than inorganic, quote unquote, naked iron. So we have clearly been eating meat. This is, this is shown in anthropology. This is shown in archeological sites, ethnography. Look at currently living hunter-gatherers like the Hadza, who I visited last year. They say that meat is the center of their life. Meat and organs, that's what they think about. That's what they dream about. They get most excited when they hunt. And they really want meat that is red meat. They don't, there's really no such thing as white meat, maybe occasionally birds in the bush in Africa, but most of what we've been eating is red meat throughout our evolution as humans and pre-hominids. Why then would red meat be bad for us? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. This is just a question that I use to frame a lot of my thinking uh, in terms of inconsistencies between what Western medicine thinks are good for humans and what humans very likely have been doing for the last 350,000 years as Homo sapiens and previously as Homo erectus and Homo habilis, pre-hominids, et cetera. So this is where I start a lot of my research questions. When there's an inconsistency in what we're told is healthy for humans and what we appear to have been doing, let's look at the medical literature in more detail. In this case, on this podcast, I wanna talk about unprocessed red meat and colon cancer. I don't think there's any real evidence that there's a causality here at all, and I will show you that throughout this podcast. I'm not going to talk about processed red meat in this podcast because, number one, I don't think you should be eating processed red meat. These cold cuts, sausages, meat products that are squished and extruded, and who knows what's in those, and who knows what additives are in those that can confound the data. I am talking about unprocessed red meat, and as we know, all processed food has been associated with cancer, not just processed meat. So consider that fact when we're talking about the processing of foods. In general, if you want a very simple dietary strategy toward better health, it is eating zero or much less processed food. Even if you choose to eat vegetables or even things like grains, the less processing you have in those foods, the better you will do. This is what's been called a whole foods diet. Now, if we consider seed oils to be processed, those will be excluded. And I think many people will do better with that intentional dietary change as well. So an unprocessed diet, regardless of what it's composed of, is probably a great place to start for most humans. Most of you listening or watching this podcast know that I think the foods most sought after by our ancestors are organs and meat, a successful hunt, all the connective tissue, all the fat, all the bone marrow, fruit when it's in season because it's sweet, honey, raw dairy more recently in human evolution. These are what comprise an animal-based diet, something that I've talked about and a term that I've coined for what I believe to be the most evolutionarily consistent diet for humans. And at the center of that animal-based diet are two groups of foods, organs, liver, spleen, kidney, these type of organs that have significant amounts of heme iron and red meat mostly, but it could be chicken or fish if you wanna eat that as well, that have been associated multiple times with colon cancer. So it's time that we really put this myth to rest that we debunk this and that we give you guys a clear perspective on what is going on here. So from the start, it's important to ask the question, why do we believe that red meat causes cancer? What evidence has been used to corroborate this assertion? Most of the time, if you ask someone who says to you, red meat is bad for you, it causes colon cancer, they will not know why they have that belief. They probably heard it on a news station or read it in some high level page on the internet that didn't actually talk about the sources. Chances are that belief is based on news media reporting on observational studies. At the beginning of any discussion of red meat and cancer, we must talk about observational epidemiology versus interventional studies. I've spoken about this in the past, so I'll make this discussion brief. Within Western medicine, there are two major types of studies that can be done. One of them actually has a control group, does an experiment, and looks to see what the outcome is. This is what's most intuitive when we think of medical research. There's an experiment, 
There's a control group that doesn't have any intervention and there's an intervention. And then we look at the results of both groups on the back end. That's an interventional study, which is what we should really be looking for to answer most of these questions. We can generate hypotheses or questions that we want to ask in interventional studies with something like an epidemiology study, an observational study. This is the majority of what's done in Western medicine, unfortunately, because they're easier and cheaper to do. But these type of studies are simply surveys. We collect groups of people, we ask them what they eat, and we follow them prospectively or we look retrospectively to see what sort of health outcomes they have. Now, this can only tell us a correlation. There's no experiment being done here. Many behaviors tend to coexist, specifically unhealthy and healthy behaviors, which can lead to unhealthy user bias and healthy user bias. What do I mean by that? I mean that in individuals, especially within the Western world, United States, et cetera, where most of the studies I'm gonna be talking about have been conducted, if you are eating a lot of meat over the last 70 years, which is when most of the cohorts are looked at for these observational studies, you are much more likely to smoke, to drink, to be obese, to be overweight. I'll be facetious here and say to ride a motorcycle, to do lots of risky things in your life, to not get colonoscopies or breast exams. You're a rebel because we've been told that red meat is bad for us. You and I may both believe that that is not true, but the mainstream narrative has been red meat is bad for you. So who eats red meat? People who disregard the mainstream. They also disregard the mainstream advice regarding alcohol and cigarettes and riding motorcycles or whatever. So this is where the unhealthy user bias comes in and observational studies with red meat correlations consistently are confounded by this. On the flip side, we have healthy user bias. Who eats more salads? Who eats more vegetables? Generally, people of higher socioeconomic status who can afford to eat those foods that are much lower in calories and still have enough food to feed their families these people are much more likely to play tennis on Sundays, to get in the sun, to have mammograms, colonoscopies, to have regular care. And like I said, to be of higher socioeconomic status, which we know consistently leads to better health outcomes in the Western world, but also in the Eastern world, as we'll talk about some studies there. So this is unhealthy user bias and healthy user bias, and they rear their ugly heads consistently in observational studies, especially observational studies looking at red meat and cancer specifically studies looking at red meat and colon cancer. So the question right off the bat that we could ask is, let's just disregard all of those observational studies regarding red meat and colon cancer. We don't care about the surveys. I will get to some of those studies later in this podcast. But if we disregard those, do we have any interventional studies on red meat and colon cancer? And we do not have studies where people are fed more red meat over time and the rates of colon cancer are looked at, at least in longer term studies. We have them in the short term and I'll talk about those in this podcast uh, in a bit. But what we do have right off the bat, I wanna start with these two critical studies. We have interventional studies, interventional studies, not observational studies, where people are fed less red meat and rates of colon cancer are observed. Reasonably, we should imagine that if red meat causes colon cancer, and people with colon cancer or precancerous lesions in their colons, or people who are at risk of developing precancerous lesions in their colons or colon cancer, reduce their consumption of red meat, you would see those colon cancers go down. That is not what we see in interventional studies. And yet these type of interventions are often ignored. They are never discussed as we will see. So two studies to look at right off the bat. This is a study from the Journal of the American Medical Association a low-fat dietary pattern and the risk of colorectal cancer. It's from the Women's Health Initiative. It's a randomized, controlled dietary modification trial. So in this trial from the Women's Health Initiative, they looked at 48,835 postmenopausal women from 50 to 79 years old between the years of 1993 and 1998. What was the intervention? They wanted those women to eat less fat, achieved by eating less meat, especially red meat and fatty red meat, along with increasing consumption of fruits and vegetables and grains. By all standards, if you suggested to a physician today what might happen in the study, they would say all kinds of good things would happen. But if you look at the conclusions here, a low-fat dietary pattern intervention did not reduce the risk of colorectal cancer in postmenopausal women during 8.1 years of follow-up. These women certainly reduced their intake of red meat along with their intake of animal fats, and it had no effect, zero effect 
on their risk of colorectal cancer. Similarly, there's a study from the New England Journal of Medicine from April of 2020. And the title says it all, lack of effect of a low fat, high fiber diet on the recurrence of colorectal adenomas. That is precancerous lesions in the colon and the rectum, which are two parts of the large intestine. Very similar study. This one is much smaller. 2,079 men and women, 35 years of age or older. They were assigned to follow a diet that is low in fat and high in fiber and fruits and vegetables and a control group given a standard brochure on healthy eating and assigned to follow their usual diets. They entered the study after undergoing complete colonoscopy, removal of adenomatous polyps, which are precancerous lesions. They remained in the study for approximately four years, having colonoscopy at one and four years after randomization. The results, adopting a diet that is low in fat, lower in red meat, and high in fiber, fruits, and vegetables does not influence the risk of recurrence of colorectal adenomas. Okay, so that was what I wanted to start with. So when we look at interventional studies in humans that certainly reduce the intake of red meat and increase vegetables and fruits and increase grains, increase fiber, things that most of Western medicine says are good for us, there was no change in the risk of colorectal adenomas, precancerous lesions in the gut. So why do we believe that red meat causes colon cancer? I'll tell you why. Let's start this story with the 2015 IARC, International Association for Research on Cancer, which is a WHO working group, report on red meat and cancer. That is where most of our misconceptions regarding red meat and cancer come from. Let me tell you the story of the IARC working group from 2015. I'm getting most of this information from David Clurfield. He was one of the members of the 22-member IARC working group, and he wrote a very interesting editorial, What is the Role of Red Meat in a Healthy Diet? So as David details in this paper, and as we know historically from the 2015 IARC report and then the subsequent 2018 report, which is in much more detail, the IARC committee was 22 members that was convened in France in 2015. This was a self-selected committee. Members could appoint themselves. And as David says in the paper, most of the members of this committee had spent their whole careers studying the relationship between meat and other foods and cancer, suggesting that there may be some intrinsic bias with these researchers in general from the very beginning. The researchers looked at over 800 articles for inclusion in their summary report and excluded all of them but 14 observational studies. This means 786 studies were excluded. They don't give any explanation of why, and this included all of the interventional animal studies. This included the two interventional studies that I detailed previously, which showed no change in cancer risk with decreased red meat. So these researchers excluded interventional studies in humans. They excluded animal studies with interventions, and they looked at 14 studies, all of which were observational. In the end, they declared that red meat was a class 2A carcinogen, and that every 50 grams of meat that you eat per day increases your risk of colon cancer by 18%, giving a relative risk of 1.18, which is very low. So you would imagine that if they looked at 14 studies that were observational in this position paper, all of the 14 must have shown very significant correlations between red meat and cancer, right? No, not true at all. Of those 14 studies, this is crazy. Eight of them showed no association between red meat and cancer. The majority of the studies used for the position paper in the 2015 IARC judgment showed no association between red meat and cancer. So for those watching, I'll show you the actual IARC paper. The title is Carcinogenicity of Consumption of Red and Processed Meat. As I said earlier in this podcast, I'm not going to talk about processed meat, only unprocessed red meat. They did look at more than 800, they say, epidemiological studies. But as I mentioned earlier, many of the interventional studies were also ignored. They looked at 14 cohort studies in the end. Even the IARC researchers <laughs> said there was inadequate evidence in experimental animals for the carcinogenicity of the consumption of red meat and processed meat. So they excluded them <laughs> just because there was inadequate evidence in animal models of the carcinogenicity of red meat they excluded those studies. They only used cohort studies, as I said, in humans. So this is what it is, and it's why most of us have been led to believe 
that red meat is linked with cancer. But let's look at those 14 observational studies out of 800 that were considered in the report. Look at this. For those who are watching, here are eight of the 14 where there was no link found between red meat consumption and colon cancer. So the majority of the studies, eight of the 14, no link found. If you're watching on YouTube, you can look at all the references and see for yourself here. Furthermore, in five of the 14, there was a trend toward correlation with red meat consumption and colon cancer that was not statistically significant. In Western medicine research, if there's a trend, but the p-value is not low enough, that is, it's not statistically significant, we generally don't report it as a true correlation. Now, there's no causation here. We don't report it as a correlation because we don't know if this correlation was caused by chance. So let's just recap here. In 13 of the 14 studies from this IARC report, there was no statistically significant connection between red meat consumption and colon cancer. And this is what has been used by the mainstream media to insert into our brains the oft parroted notion that red meat causes colon cancer over and over and over. If you repeat a lie enough times, it becomes the truth, I guess. I've said this before. I believe that's from one of the Nazi communication ministers from World War II, that saying. So what's left in the IARC report? There's one study left. Out of the 14 studies they considered, 14 cohort studies, 14 observational cohort studies, there's one study left where there was a statistically significant correlation between red meat and colon cancer. Let's look at that study in detail. So here is the one study that shows this statistically significant correlation. It's called Dietary Risk Factors for Colon Cancer in a Low-Risk Population. The authors are Singh and Frazier. It is from 1998. What you find if you look at the study is that it is observational epidemiology done on non-Hispanic white cohort members of the Adventist Health Study in California from 1976 to 1982. Now, the Adventist Health Study from California was done in Seventh-day Adventists in California, mostly living in Loma Linda, California. This is a population of people I've spoken about before. Connected with this religious affiliation, Seventh-day Adventism is a leaning toward veganism and vegetarianism. People within this community generally do not eat meat for religious reasons. This is clearly a narrative that sets us up to have an unhealthy user bias. Because who in this community is going to eat red meat? People who are more rebellious. And this sets us up to have a healthy user bias. Who in this community is not going to eat red meat? People that are less rebellious, people that follow the rules, people that espouse the religious beliefs of this Seventh-day Adventist community. So what do we find in this study? If you look at the results, you find that the people who had the highest risk of cancers were those who had lower legume intakes and higher body mass. These associations, I'm reading from the paper now, raise the possibility that the risk due to meat intake is mediated by multiple mechanisms, one of which may involve red meat intake in a constellation of causal factors that produces higher plasma insulin levels. Basically, the authors are saying that the people who ate the most red meat were also the fattest and appeared to have the highest levels of fasting insulin. Well, does obesity have a risk of cancer? Yes, especially colon cancers. Does insulin resistance have a risk of cancer? Yes, absolutely, especially colon cancers. Is it possible that the people eating the most red meat were also the most fat, the most obese, the most insulin resistant, and the red meat had nothing to do with that. It was other health behaviors they were doing, seed oils, processed sugars, we can hypothesize about this all day long, that created states of obesity and insulin resistance, and that is where their increased risk of cancer came from. It is absolutely possible. And yet, this is the one study out of the 14 in the IARC monograph where there was a statistically significant correlation between red meat and cancer, and is based in a population where the risk of confounding is very high, especially unhealthy user bias. For the sake of completeness, you can consider this paper, Obesity and the Cancer Risk, Recent Review and Evidence, to corroborate the notion that obesity itself is associated with increased rates of cancer. And there are many other papers which corroborate the notion that diabetes is associated with an increased rate of cancer as well. Consider this table 
of meta-analyses of the relative risk of cancer in diabetic patients. Relative risks are pretty high, especially in liver and pancreas, but we can go by organs. Um, the relative risk of cancer in the liver is 2.5. Uh, the relative risk of colon-related cancers is 1.3 to 1.4. Um, clearly, rates of cancer are higher in diabetics, yet we are led to believe that it was the red meat in this one study that was the causative factor. You can see here from a 2015 paper that obesity is associated with cancer of the esophagus and of the endometrium for women, and also with colon cancer. So there's really no question that obesity, diabetes, the insulin resistance syndrome is associated with cancer, thus making it pretty hard to draw any sort of causative inference from this one study out of 14 from the IARC report. And yet, as I've said earlier, this IARC monograph is the main thing that most people will look to to say the WHO says red meat is a class 2A carcinogen. So let's go a little deeper down the rabbit hole into the type of things that the IARC monograph left out. As I've said, this monograph looked at 14 cohort studies, 14 studies that were observational epidemiology, and glaringly left out observational studies like this one from Asians. The title of this study is Meat Intake and Cause-Specific Mortality, a Pooled Analysis of Asian Prospective Cohort Studies. This one looks at over 300,000 individuals and finds that an increase in red meat intake in Asian countries was inversely associated with cardiovascular mortality in men and with cancer mortality in women. That's a convenient thing for the IARC to leave out of their analysis. A 300,000 plus patient population in Asia where more red meat was associated with lower rates of cardiovascular disease in men and lower rates of cancer in women? What's going on here? Is red meat good for Asians and bad for us in the United States? No, it has nothing to do with this. We're all humans. We're all homo sapiens. Red meat should be good for all of us if we believe in evolutionary consistency of diet. What's going on here is the narrative in Asia is different than the narrative in the Western world. The Western narrative is that red meat is bad for us. So who eats more red meat? People that are more rebellious. In Asia, the narrative is that red meat is associated with affluence. So who eats more red meat? people that are more financially well-off. And we know that a superior financial status is correlated consistently with better health outcomes. So there are many studies like this in other parts of the world where the narrative may be different that show different epidemiologic findings, but they're consistently ignored in the West because they don't fit the narrative that so many of these self-selected individuals on the IARC committee from 2015 appear to have been looking to advance. I'll discuss the potential mechanisms that have been advanced by which red meat may cause colon cancer in humans later on in this podcast, and I will discuss why I don't think any of them are valid. But consider this interventional study in humans looking at markers of oxidative stress. The title of this study is Increased Lean Red Meat Intake Does Not Elevate Markers of Oxidative Stress and Inflammation in Humans. What you find in this study is that People were instructed to decrease their grain-based carbohydrates, thumbs up for that, and increase their red meat consumption by eight ounces per day. That's a lot for the average American. Another half pound of meat per day, that's significant. And this is an interventional study. They looked at markers of oxidative stress. What were the results? Our results suggest that the partial replacement of dietary carbohydrates with protein from red meat does not elevate oxidative stress or inflammation. I'm not sure how an interventional study like that could have been left out of an IARC monograph or not reported on by the mainstream media because inflammation and oxidative stress are the mechanisms at the center of the hypothesis for how red meat causes colon cancer in humans in general. And yet interventional studies in humans show that increasing red meat doesn't increase inflammation markers or oxidative stress. So how exactly do we think red meat is causing colon cancer in humans? If you said new 5 gc I'll get to that one in this podcast as well. Not something I'm worried about. What about animal models? There's a lot of interesting evidence in animals that red meat has no problematic effects. Consider this study showing that beef tallow is actually protective against precancerous lesions relative to soybean oil. Isn't that interesting? So here we are back in animal models, which consistently show that seed oils are bad for animal models. We still need more evidence to translate that to humans, but 
The title of this study is Beef Tallow Increases Apoptosis, that's programmed cell death, and decreases aberrant crypt foci formation relative to soybean oil in the rat colon. Aberrant crypt foci are places within the gut where there are precancerous lesions developing. So beef tallow protects rats' guts from cancer. That's interesting. Well, humans have been eating beef tallow, animal fats from ruminant animals, ancestors of beef for a long time. I would very much like to see, I would love to see an interventional study like this in humans, but I don't see why it would be any different. I wouldn't be surprised at all if beef tallow is also protective against human guts. Sadly, I'm not sure this study will be done anytime soon. Perhaps if we get a ton of funding for the ABNRF, the Animal Based Nutrition Research Foundation, you can find us at abnrf.org. We may be able to do interventional studies like this, but we're going to start with a, um, with a pilot study that's interventional looking at animal-based diets and autoimmune disease in humans. But how interesting would it be to do a study looking at tallow as a protective fat for humans in adenocarcinoma or do prospective studies in humans that are interventional where one group eats a standard amount of meat and one group actually increases their amount of meat. That would be fascinating. There's another study that's been <laughs> talked about a lot. The effect of meat, beef, chicken, and bacon on rat colon carcinogenesis. And bacon lovers can rejoice on this one because a bacon-based diet <laughs> appears to protect against carcinogenesis. The authors say perhaps because bacon contains 5% sodium chloride and increase the rat's water intake. But at least in this study with rats, bacon consumption was protective against colon cancer and beef and chicken did not worsen colon cancer in the rats as well. So this is essentially what's going on in the IARC report. They're saying there's not consistent evidence in animal models to show that red meat is causing colon cancers. Therefore, we're going to just ignore it. And as I'll talk about later in this podcast, the studies in animal models, rats and mice, that do show that components of red meat or red meat are associated with increased rates of colon cancer are consistently done in calcium deficient models. Well, I believe humans should be intaking calcium on a daily basis, either from raw dairy is a great source, raw cheese, raw butter, uh, raw sour cream, raw milk, or kefir, or from things like ground up bones. You can get bone matrix from hardened soil supplements if you want microcrystalline hydroxyapatite if you're not doing dairy in your diet. But getting some calcium in your diet has a lot of benefits. There's a ton of literature in the GI cancer space to suggest that calcium intake is associated with lower rates of colon issues. And we know from other conversations that I've had that increased rates of calcium consumption probably decrease your body's absorption of oxalates. Something I talked about with Sally Norton a few months ago. I don't think you want to be eating a lot of oxalates in general, but calcium consumption in your diet will increase the absorption of those oxalates in your gut. So getting calcium in your diet is a good thing. Humans probably should be eating some calcium and yet in animal models, you must make the rats or mice calcium deficient to see any problems with red meat in terms of colon cancer or the components of red meat. That's strange. So one more epidemiology study I'll talk about here. Cancer incidence in vegetarians results from the European Perspective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition. This is Epic Oxford. I wonder why the uh, IARC left this one out. It's from 2009, so it was definitely published. They said the incidence of colorectal cancer was higher in vegetarians. Then in meat eaters, that's strange. Um, for completeness, they say, within the study, the incidence of all cancers combined was lower among vegetarians than meat eaters, but the incidence of colorectal cancer was higher in vegetarians than meat eaters. So here we have epidemiology that says vegetarians get more cancers in the colon than meat eaters. The epidemiology also shows that overall, vegetarians had less cancers. Who knows what's going on there? Perhaps uh, meat contributes to other cancers, or this could be a healthy user bias effect. But the point of this is to say that I don't understand why the IARC leaves this one out when they're talking about colorectal cancer. And you've probably not heard about this finding regarding meat. It's observational evidence. So I don't think it's that valuable, but I wanted to highlight the difference and the fact that there's plenty of epidemiology, both from Asia or from the UK, showing that red meat may not be bad for colorectal cancers at all. And in fact, in this study, it was protective. Here's a meta-analysis of animal fat and animal protein. They usually occur together. Uh, intake on colorectal cancer from 2009. This was definitely available to the researchers in the IARC committee. And they say, on the basis of the results of this quantitative assessment, the available epidemiologic evidence does not appear to support an independent association between animal fat intake or animal protein intake on colorectal cancer. 
Why would the IARC leave this one out? That's strange. I want to show you one more study looking at interventions reducing red meat. This is a study clearly doing that. The potential effects of reduced red meat compared with increased fiber and intake on glucose metabolism and liver fat content. So this one's not looking at colorectal cancer, but they are looking at other outcomes that would probably be linked in some way. We know that glucose metabolism dysregulation is linked to cancers and liver fat content is associated with insulin resistance, et cetera. It's a randomized and controlled dietary intervention study. As you can see here in the conclusions, in the context of caloric restriction, there seems to be no additional beneficial impact of reduced red meat intake or increased fiber intake on improvement in cardiometabolic risk parameters. So decreasing red meat, increasing fiber did nothing more for this group. Again, they uh, decreased their daily caloric intake by 400 kcal, so this was a hypocaloric intervention. Nevertheless, it was an interventional study which showed, again, no benefits to reducing red meat in the human diet. Again, sort of left questioning the validity of the IARC report and the validity of our mainstream understanding of red meat and cancer. Here's an interesting abstract from a Chinese cohort, carbohydrates and colorectal cancer risk among Chinese in North America. Data indicate that increased carbohydrate and total carbohydrate consumption are both associated with increased risk of colorectal cancer in both sexes. And that among women, the relative risk appears to be greatest for the right colon, also known as the cecum, whereas among men, the relative risk appears to be greatest for the rectum. I'm guessing you've never heard the mainstream media report on the risks of eating bread or rice for anyone of Asian, specifically Chinese descent in North America, because that appears to increase colorectal cancer risk as well, according to that epidemiology. I think that after doing all of this research and, and talking about this so much on the podcast, I'll editorialize this a little bit and just say that there seems to be an anti-meat agenda in this country, and I'm not sure where it comes from. I don't want to get conspiratorial. But even within the medical research, it seems that everyone knows, quote unquote, that red meat is bad for humans. And so if you try and publish a study that goes against that counter narrative, there's a lot of mainstream zeitgeist narratives now that are difficult to go upstream of or swim against. But in, in medicine, if you try and publish or you have an idea that red meat is perhaps not bad for humans or perhaps even good for humans, you're swimming upstream. And I don't understand why there is this anti-meat narrative. I suspect that it may be driven by profiteering of anti-meat companies, plant-based companies, but that's just speculation. And I don't want to get, like I said, too far down that rabbit hole. But the selective reporting within the news media, the selective reporting within the internet and our current understanding of these topics really has me thinking about why so many of these studies are not talked about. Perhaps it's also because of this quote unquote climate change narrative, something I've spoken about a ton in the past and uh, done my best to show evidence and debunk any notions that cows are contributing to climate change in any way. I believe that narrative is being uh, advanced by agribusiness, plant-based companies, and that's something that's also insidious and not supported by the research. So anyway, aside, soapbox uh, done. Let's return to um, some more technical analysis of this question at hand. For the sake of completeness, I do want to show this uh, supporting information from a paper um, from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2015, showing uh, 23 observational epidemiology studies linking red meat with cancer. So it's out there. This is not to say that these studies don't exist, but again, as I spoke about, these are observational studies, and could they be confounded by healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias. I showed a couple of observational studies that showed opposite results that are generally ignored. And I showed interventional studies showing that either increasing red meat does not increase markers of inflammation or oxidative stress, and decreasing red meat does not change colon cancer outcomes or liver fat and glucose control outcomes. In this example and this list of studies, they go on to talk about uh, the new 5 GC and new 5 AC content of foods that's something I'll talk about later in this podcast. I think that the authors of this paper are hoping to support the notion that new 5 GC, a sialic acid found in red meat, um, but not found in human physiology after a mutation in a gene called CMAH two to three million years ago, uh, may be driving some of this colon cancer risk. Again, I don't think that's anything to be worried about. I think it's a total red herring. We'll get into it in a little bit. Before we move on to 
mechanistic explanations of why red meat may be causing cancer, at least mechanistic explanations that are advanced within the popular press to explain this phenomenon. Um, I want to share one paper that came out in 2019 that got a good amount of press from the Annals of Internal Medicine. And this is a re-examination of the data, thankfully, by some a uh, large group of scientists. The title is Patterns of Red and Processed Meat Consumption and Risk for Cardiometabolic and Cancer Outcomes. Um, the conclusion says it all. Low or very low certainty evidence suggests that dietary patterns with less red and processed meat intake may result in a very small reduction of adverse cardiometabolic and cancer outcomes. So basically the reviewers are saying that there's not enough good evidence to make a, a real profound statement here. <laughs> We're looking at low or very low certainty evidence, and very small reductions in adverse cardiometabolic and cancer outcomes. This paper got a lot of press in 2019 as I was finishing the writing of my first book, The Carnivore Code, but we don't hear about it so much anymore. <laughs> Mostly what we hear about is the IARC WHO report, which we've talked about as being pretty darn inconclusive and lacking in so many ways. So what are the mechanisms by which red meat is purported to cause colon cancer. I believe the, the big ones are heme iron, n nitroso compounds, NU5GC, and heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. I'll go through all of those briefly. This is a very large and deep and twisty rabbit hole. The best paper I've found here to talk about these is this one, uh, Red Meat and Colon Cancer, a review of the mechanistic evidence for heme in the context of risk assessment methodology. I'll read from the abstract and then I will give you guys the high level here. They say, consequently, this review critically examined studies that investigated mechanistic evidence associated with heme iron to assess the weight of the evidence associating red meat exposure with colorectal cancer. They precede all of that talking about the October 2015 IARC report in which the working group cited potential mechanistic evidence for meat components, including uh, those formed from meat processing, such as N-nitroso compounds, heterocyclic aromatic amines, and the endogenous compound heme iron. Uh, further on in the abstract, they say, the evidence from in vitro studies utilize conditions that are not necessarily relevant for a normal dietary intake and thus do not provide sufficient evidence that heme exposure from typical red meat consumption would increase the risk of colon cancer. So they're saying that there is a significant amount of research that's been done in test tubes looking at heme iron, and most of that is done with massive doses of heme iron that would be impossible even for someone like me to achieve with our consumption of red meat. So in vitro evidence, probably dose-dependent inconsistencies. And why are we relying on in vitro evidence regarding heme iron and potential mechanisms for colon cancer anyway? Animal studies, they go on, utilize models that tested promotion of pre-neoplastic, pre-cancerous conditions, utilizing a diet that is low in calcium, high in fat, mostly seed oils, combined with exaggerations of heme exposure that in many instances represented intakes that were orders of magnitude above normal dietary consumption of red meat. So they're saying animal studies, calcium deficient models, as I spoke about earlier, and orders of magnitude higher levels of heme iron and components of red meat than most people are getting in their diets. One order of magnitude is 10X, two orders of magnitude would be 100X, et cetera. Finally, they continue, clinical evidence suggests that the type of N-nitroso compound found after ingestion of red meat in humans consists mainly of nitrosyl iron and nitrosyl thiols, products that have profoundly different chemistries from certain N-nitroso species, which have been shown to be tumorigenic, that is forming tumors, through the formation of DNA adducts, that is when DNA is cross-linked. In conclusion, the methodologies improved in current studies of heme have not provided sufficient documentation that the mechanisms involved would contribute to an increased risk of promotion of preneoplasia or colon cancer at usual dietary intakes of red meat in the context of a normal diet. This paper is quite comprehensive, and I'll leave it to uh, those of you who are very interested to actually read the paper and go through all of the studies that they discuss, but they provide a very large amount of evidence to support each of their claims, reviewing in vitro data, animal studies, and nitroso compounds, which are very interesting and should be examined in detail. But I found it quite intriguing that we often think about these N nitroso compounds as one group causing DNA adducts, covalent bonding of some carcinogenic compound to the DNA, 
when in fact there are different types of nitroso compounds which have profoundly different chemistries as the authors in this paper point out. So we are essentially conflating different types of nitroso compounds. The high level here is that when we look at mechanisms involved in the formation of colon cancer, it doesn't hold up to a lot of scrutiny in the literature. And this is not surprising to us, is it? We've been eating red meat for so long as humans, why would it be harmful to humans? If you go further and you look at studies of heterocyclic amines or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, there's really only an increased risk association. Again, this is epidemiology. No one can really do these interventional studies in humans at the highest level of exposure of HCAs, heterocyclic amines, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. What does that mean? It means that you shouldn't char your meat, <laughs> that you shouldn't eat burned meat every day, and then you won't put yourself in the highest level of exposure to heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. There's also evidence that lower amounts of these compounds will be formed if your meat is marinated. Uh, I would not marinate your meat with seed oils. I would not even marinate your meat with olive oil because I'm not a fan of linoleic acid in that. But adding rosemary to plant, I know, will decrease the formation of these compounds in meat for the sake of completeness in this discussion. I would rather not overcook my meat on the grill than add rosemary, but I think very few people are going to have issues with rosemary, though it is a plant food. It's a plant leaf. The amounts used are very small. There's also evidence that consumption of meat with a variety of foods, um, I'm consuming my meat with fruit, you may consume your meat with fruit or vegetables, may mitigate some of these effects. So we need to understand that these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and heterocyclic amines are probably not an issue for most humans eating an animal-based diet of organs, either fresh or desiccated, fruit, meat, honey, raw dairy, that's the source of calcium, et cetera. If you want to eat vegetables, great. As I've said in the past, I don't think vegetables are ideal for humans. These are the parts of plants that are most highly defended. But if you're thriving on vegetables, eat them all you want. I just have seen so many stories now of people who were not thriving with autoimmune disease, et cetera, cutting vegetables out, seeing profound improvements, that it's something that I feel compelled to talk about in my work in general. But I think that the framing for all of this work should be the question of, are you thriving? If you are, don't change anything about your diet. If you're not, question your long-held nutritional beliefs, but I think that all of you will do better by including animal foods, organs, and meat as the center of your diet. That's where most of the nutrients come from, and the mechanistic associations with that are not really supported by the science. Let's move on to talk about new 5 gc as we wrap up this podcast. So new 5 gc seems to come up every few years when someone on YouTube does a video about it, <laughs> like it's a new thing, but We've known about it for quite some time, and it doesn't seem to be a problem for humans, and I'll tell you why. NU5GC is a sialic acid. There is uh, no NU5GC in our bodies. There is an enzyme that makes NU5GC from a compound in our bodies that we do have, NU5AC, called CMAH. As I mentioned in this podcast, that enzyme was lost two to three million years ago. We don't fully understand why, probably due to some sort of protection from infectious insults. But NU5GC is very similar to NU5AC, different in one atom. And the hypothesis goes that because we don't have NU5GC in our bodies, when we eat NU5GC in the meat that we are eating, we develop antibodies to NU5GC, and that could lead to increased rates of colon cancer or other cancers in humans. Well, there's some pretty interesting research looking at high levels of anti-NU5GC antibodies in patients receiving kidney transplants. I'm not sure how anyone can talk about new 5 gc as a problem when they see papers like this one. No increase in colon cancer risk following induction with new 5 gc bearing rabbit anti-T-cell IgG in recipients of kidney transplants. I'll break it down for you guys. When people get kidney transplants in the United States, they get rabbit anti-T-cell IgG, which is a collection of immunoglobulins and there is new 5 gc in there because it's from rabbits who have new 5 gc which leads to humans who are receiving these kidney transplants and get this anti t cell igg therapy to develop many more new 5 gc antibodies and so we can look at that portion of the population in this controlled group of kidney transplant recipients and see that there is no increased risk of colon cancer in those people which essentially debunks the notion that new 5GC is harmful for humans at all. As you can see here from the abstract, we took advantage of the evidence that rabbit IgG elicits an immune response against new 5GC, consulted a large database of allograft recipients, that is kidney transplant recipients, 
um, based on this data from 173,960 and 38,505 patients without and with ATG induction respectively, we found no evidence that exposure to higher levels of anti-new 5GC is associated with a higher incidence of colon cancer. You'd probably have to eat a lot of red meat to get levels of anti-new 5GC, IgG, or antibodies that these kidney transplant recipients had, but nevertheless, in the follow-up from them, there was no increased rate of colon cancers. Furthermore, we can look to the animal kingdom, something that Western medicine um, doesn't do very often, but I find quite revealing. Ferrets are part of a family of animals called mustelids, and ferrets do not have new 5GC similar to humans. They've also lost the ability to create that sialic acid from new 5 ac or other precursor sialic acids. Now, ferrets eat animals with new 5 gc in them. They eat voles and mice and rabbits, perhaps, animals with new 5 gc So here we have a model of an animal like humans without new 5 gc eating animals with new 5 gc And according to the zoologist that I consult, uh, ferrets are not going extinct from cancers of any type due to this aberrant consumption of new 5 gc in their prey. So there are numerous lines of evidence that point to the idea that new 5 gc is not harmful for humans. If you don't know what new 5 gc is, don't worry about it. If you've heard about it and you've heard people say it's harmful for humans, challenge them with that evidence and see what comes out in the mix. I don't think they'll have any answers for it. Why would something that has been at the center of the human diet for hundreds of thousands of years and pre-hominid evolution uh, was a critical factor in that as well, be harmful for humans. I don't think that makes any sense. And in this podcast, I've talked a lot about why we believe red meat is harmful for us, the IARC report, how flawed the report is, other evidence that does not support any conceptualization of red meat being harmful for humans. And we went through all the mechanistic data, or at least scratched the surface on different mechanisms. Heme iron, not a problem because in vitro studies use doses that are massive, or Animal models use calcium-deficient rat models and high doses and nitroso compounds, not the same ones formed in humans from eating meat as have been shown to form DNA adducts or be problematic at the DNA level. PCHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or heterocyclic amines, probably not an issue for humans unless you're eating exclusively burned charred meat uh, without anything else, no fruit, no vegetables, no spices, nothing. Uh, I will say that I prefer my meat with no spices, just salt. But uh, again, I do eat some fruit with it, so that's probably helpful for me on an animal-based diet. Surely there are some compounds in the fruit that may affect those within the human gut. So I am 45. Uh, I've never had a colonoscopy, but when I do get one, <laughs> I'll keep you guys posted. <laughs> Though there are some DNA markers that can be done in the stool and even some blood markers, I believe, of colon cancer risk that I can do that might be interesting to look at. As I've done in my analysis of myself with my blood work, I've tried to open the kimono and just show you guys how I'm faring as a human male that's 45. I don't take any drugs, no hormones. You can see how I look and perform on Instagram if you wanna see more about who I am. But um, I show you guys my labs, how they look, things that I'm still trying to optimize. But uh, eating an animal-based diet has been pretty darn impactful for me. I had severe eczema on my wrists, my arms, my hips, my elbows which got a lot better when I cut vegetables out of my diet and has recurred with the inclusion of some vegetables as I've tried to reintroduce or recurred with the inclusion of things like chocolate, et cetera. So um, now I'm eating a diet of organs, fresh and desiccated from heart and soil supplements, meat, predominantly red meat. I did my blood work uh, from July and August and showed you guys all my markers with that type of a diet. I have a significant amount of carbohydrates from fruit, adding fruit back to my diet was a massive help for me. Long-term ketogenic diet did not work well for me at all, leading to heart palpitations and electrolyte deficiencies. I think keto is going to be a problem for most humans uh, long-term, and there are better ways to control appetite. I've recently reintroduced raw dairy to my diet and found that to be a quite enjoyable source of nutrients and variety in my diet. Doesn't trigger my eczema the way that pasteurized dairy did. In my reels on Instagram, I've talked about differences between raw and pasteurized dairy. That's a subject for a different podcast, but uh, high level uh, pasteurization of dairy beyond 65 degrees centigrade appears to change the conformation of whey protein, perhaps making it more allergenic or abrogating some of the benefits of native whey protein because we know, at least from observational studies in kids, that kids who grew up eating raw dairy have lower rates of allergies, eczema, uh, 
and asthma, et cetera. Wish I'd had raw dairy when I was a kid. I had pasteurized dairy and I had eczema and asthma throughout my life. That was the reason that I originally started down this path as a resident physician at the University of Washington and then eventually decided that Western medicine really was missing so many of these key pieces of uh, how to treat illness that I started doing what I do now, which is mostly podcasting and education. I don't see patients in the hospital anymore. I feel like I can do more good this way or at least get more curious discussions started. So hopefully some of you have benefited from this work. I'll close with a couple more pieces of information that I think add to this discussion. The first is a, is a chart. I don't remember exactly where I got it. I forget what reference this is, but you can see here that um, if you look at the meat consumption per year in kilograms across the USA, France, Colombia, and Cuba, and Armenia, it declines with the US being 119 kilograms per year, going to Armenia with 16 kilograms per year. And then digestive cancers per 1,000 go uh, essentially in the opposite direction with no real correlation. Colombia has 37 kilograms of meat per year, and they have uh, an incidence of 16.2 digestive cancers per 1,000, while the US has 119 kilograms of meat consumption per year by our population with digestive cancers at 4.6 per 1,000. So if you look at correlations here between per capita consumption of meat and incidence of all digestive cancers, esophagus, stomach, colon, and rectum, you won't find any correlation there. And one last study in animal models to close the podcast, the effect of dietary unsaturated and saturated fats on azoxymethane-induced colon cancer in rats. Basically, they're using a compound called azoxy methane to induce colon cancer in rats. And as you can see here, when they do that with saturated fat, there was no increase in tumor burden. But when they fed rats unsaturated fat, they had a significantly higher incidence of colon tumors than they did with the saturated fat. So again, this is an animal model. We cannot always translate this to humans, but I think it's interesting that so much of the evidence that is levied against red meat is from uh, calcium deficient animal models. Perhaps we should look at animal models of colon cancer, uh, like this one that suggests that when you uh, induce colon cancers and give polyunsaturated fats, there is a much higher rate of colon cancers than if you give saturated fats. So as I showed earlier in the podcast, tallow was protective in rat models of crypt foci that were aberrant. So animal studies definitely make polyunsaturated fats look bad uh, in all the ways, especially for colon cancers and saturated fats look pretty good. And we still need studies in humans to see how well that translates. But I think evolutionarily, that would make a lot of sense for us. So red meat and cancer, not something to worry about in my opinion. Uh, hopefully the collection of data here I have given you will uh, arm you in your discussions regarding this and you will understand where the misleading zeitgeist currently comes from and you will rebel against it and thrive in whatever way you see fit in your own life. So thanks guys, talk to you soon.